Alrighty, everybody, by my clock, it is one o'clock mountain time, and that means it is time for us to get started with scientists in action, vets and their pets. My name is Talia, I'm part of the virtual experiences team at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and today I am connected to two experts in veterinary medicine who have very different jobs, very different specialties, but a lot of really cool things to say. We both, uh, both of them are connected right now. We've got Dr. Katie Simpson and Dr. Sarah Shropshire, and in just a few moments, they are going to take it away and tell you all about their fascinating careers in veterinary medicine, but just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going. Number one, I would like to begin today by respectfully acknowledging that the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and Colorado State University are on the traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Ute, Arapaho, and Osheti Shikoan nations, as well as other traditional keepers. I also want to acknowledge that we are currently connected to students from all across the United States. We've got Colorado, Illinois, Florida, Ohio, I think I'm blanking on several others, maybe even Washington. We've got lots of different states represented today, and in just a few moments when I open up the chat, you might be able to tell us where you're from. That's always cool for us to get to know. A couple of other things you need to know is that if you are one of our on-camera groups, please stay muted until we call on you. We will know, we will let you know when it is your turn to ask a question. I will handle spotlighting your video so that everyone can see your smiling face. You'll need to unmute your microphone, ask us your question in a nice, loud, and clear voice. And if you remember, tell us your name. If you're watching as a view only participant today, we can't see you or hear you. And the way that we're gonna be able to interact with you today is via the chat. I have the chat closed down right now and I'll tell you why in just a moment, but the chat is gonna be where we collect your questions, your comments and the answers that you have to the questions we give you. Now, a note on that chat. We wanna make sure that we're able to get through as many questions as possible today. We have over a hundred people connected to this call right now, which is a lot of people and they're all gonna have questions. They're all gonna have things to say. And I wanna be able to find those questions easily and simply. So please do me a favor today. Please don't fill up the chat with things like hi and OMG and LOL and you that's so gross because first of all I want to make sure I can get to everybody's questions and second of all it might be distracting to your fellow learners so teachers I'm going to rely on you today if you can see that your students are not using their chat privileges correctly to step in and send a message and say hey everybody please make sure that you're on task and if I need to I might shut down that chat to get us all back on task and then open it back up again when we need. Thanks everybody for your cooperation. And with that, I think we're ready to jump in. So I would like to introduce you to our two experts in veterinary medicine. First of all, I'm gonna have Dr. Sarah Shropshire introduce herself and tell us a little bit about her career as a small animal internal medicine expert. Now, she doesn't always work with small animals only. She's got a pretty fascinating job and I'll let her take it away. Hi everybody, thanks for joining today. Um, again, my name is Sarah, um, and I predominantly work with dogs and cats. Um, and essentially, on a day to day basis, we see dogs and cats that don't feel well or are behaving abnormally for all sorts of different reasons. Um, could be anything something's wrong with their gut, something's wrong with their kidneys, their liver, something is going on in their blood. So we see a variety of things. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit later on, but we also do quite a bit of endoscopy, which involves a little camera so we can see inside of our patients. Um, and that's a lot of fun and we can talk a little bit more about that, but that's pretty much what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And my specialty is internal medicine. Lots of problems to solve, lots of cute animals you get to work with. Uh, sounds like a fascinating career to me. Next up, let's hear from Dr. Katie Simpson, who has a slightly different specialty. Katie, tell us about your job. So I am what's called a farm animal or a livestock veterinarian. So most of the species that I work with would be cattle, sheep, goats, um, pigs, llamas and alpacas. Um, we actually will sometimes work on animals that are called wild ruminants like bison or maybe deer, um, and we'll see them for a whole lot of different problems. So things like having trouble having a baby, or maybe they need an operation, or um, you know, maybe, maybe a baby calf breaks its leg and now it's gonna need to have that fixed with a cast or with surgery. Um, and then like, kind of like with Dr. Shropshire, sometimes we'll see an animal that just quit eating and so the owner will bring it into us and we'll get to try to solve the mystery of why it's not wanting to eat, which is really cool. 
Yeah, I think one of the big things that we hope all of you take away from this experience today is that veterinarians are problem solvers. A lot of the time, they're presented with issues that aren't straightforward, aren't simple, have to be figured out with all kinds of different tools and technologies, and might even take some different kinds of techniques than treating a similar issue in a person. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but for now, we want to bring up a poll. We know you love polls. Uh, we're going to bring up an interactive poll that asks you all to vote on why would you bring your pet to the vet? So in just a moment, you're going to see a poll pop up on your screen. There it is. Uh, tell us what you think. If you are watching, if you're doing remote learning today, uh, please let us know what you think. You can cast your own vote. If you are part of a group that is all together today, teachers, I'll have you survey your students and put their answer, their winning answer into the poll. We'll leave it open for maybe 30 or 40 more seconds. I can see one standout answer right now. One answer is getting a lot of votes. Um, and yes, if you uh, don't see the poll, I see some people are responding in the chat, you can respond there as well. But if the poll is working for you, that's where we'd like to see your answer. Just a few more moments, get those votes in. Let's see what the answer is. Our vets are gonna tell you if you were right. So it looks like we got some votes for you take a pet to the vet because they are sick, some for because they need a checkup, and a lot of votes for all of the above. So did they get it right? They did. Yeah, great job. Everybody. Yeah, you take an animal to the vet for any one of those reasons. And with that, I'd like to invite both of our vets to tell you a little bit more in depth about what their jobs are like, what sorts of problems they solve, uh, what sorts of tools they might use, whether an animal is coming to them because it's well, needs a shot, needs a checkup, needs some treatment for something that could potentially be wrong, or maybe even some of all of those things. So I'm going to call on Dr. Shropshire first. Tell us a little bit about your experience as an internal medicine specialist. What's it like to work with dogs and cats and help owners solve their pets' problems? Yeah, um, it is different every single day. Um, I'm never, ever bored. Um, we see all sorts of different problems um, for us. We typically have, um, we are seeing animals that are not feeling well that may have likely already been seen by a veterinarian, um, by your family veterinarian, and are referred to us as specialists to help um, keep looking and try to figure it out. So my job is a little bit of detective work. So it's constantly solving puzzles, trying to figure out what's wrong, how can we fix it, um, so it's, it's pretty challenging every day, but also a lot of fun if you like puzzles um, and figuring things out. And we do quite a bit of procedures as well. Um, the endoscopy, like I mentioned, we also heavily are involved in things like blood transfusion. So if your dog or cat ever needed blood, we are often quite involved with that. Um, and we do all sorts of other things like sampling from different body parts as well. So again, it's lots and lots of variety um, that we get to do. Yeah, it sounds like a fascinating job. And yeah, you do have the interesting task of having to figure out what's going on inside an animal. You might not be able to even tell from the outside what exactly is going wrong. You just know that something is a little bit off. And so that's an interesting puzzle and mystery that you have to solve. Now, Dr. Simpson, as we, as we have said, has a different sort of specialty. Dr. Simpson, can you tell us a little bit about your work? And you also brought some really interesting and kind of scary looking tools today. So we would love to have you show those off. So we work on patients that range from about one pound, like for a little baby miniature pig, all the way up to about 3,000 pounds for some of the bulls that we would potentially work on. And so um, we do all kinds of interesting procedures. That one's a goat, actually, that we were looking at. Um, and sometimes, you know, they will have an illness. So you might listen to their, listen to their heart and listen to their chest, like in that picture. Um, sometimes we figure out quickly what's wrong and we might end up needing to treat them or medicate them. Um, but due to their size, they're a little bit different from people in that, um, you know, they don't always want to do what we want them to do, whether that's standing still um, or taking a medication that we might 
need to give them. And so instead of doing things like asking them to swallow a pill with some water, we actually have equipment that can help us um, treat them. So this is actually what we would use to give a cow a pill. Um, you would probably not appreciate it if your doctor came towards you with <laughs> something like this. But um, it's really helpful to have the kind of equipment that you need to do it, which is pretty different from a lot of other species um, needs and the types of things that you would use on them. Other things we have are things like this, which are um, looks kind of more like something from Friday the 13th, but is actually um, just a toenail trimmer for a cow or a bull. Um, and so we might see an animal that comes in and has a lameness and it's coming from their foot most of the time. And so we could also use that to kind of peel it away. It'd be kind of like if you had cracked your fingernail, um, but instead of just it being on your hand, you were actually having to walk on that. Um, and so we see all kinds of different problems. We might use an ultrasound to look for um, babies and see if they're pregnant. We might do some blood work um, to see what's going on with their different body systems, or we might even look under a microscope at different tissues um, to see if we can, or cells, and figure out kind of what is wrong with a sick animal, too. Yeah, you too have a lot of problems that you have to solve. Um, and again, it's not always readily apparent what they are. One thing that we've talked about a little bit today, this is our fourth session of the day. And one theme that's come up throughout all of the sessions that we've done is some of the special challenges that go along with veterinary medicine. And I think there are a couple that are different. There are a few things that are different about treating animals than treating humans. And I wonder if both of you can speak to that for just a couple of minutes. And so Dr. Simpson, let's start with you because you sometimes have to put these big animals into special contraptions just to make sure that the work you need to do gets done. So tell us a little bit about that. What's different about treating animals, especially large animals than treating humans? So great questions and then that has come up in, in our sessions and so um, one of the things is that our, our animals, the types of species that we work on, are prey animals in the wild. And so um, other animals might hunt them or eat them. And so they've actually evolved to try to protect themselves by staying away from danger. Um, so having a tendency to run away from something that they think might hurt them, um, which a lot of times they might think that people could hurt them. And then the other thing um, is that a lot of times, uh, in part due to that as well, um, they're a little bit harder to handle because they're scared and they don't want to be caught and they don't want to show um, sickness or illness that might look like weakness. Um, and so oftentimes we have to be a little careful about how we, how we handle them and how we restrain them. So the cows you see in this picture um, those had halters on, it's kind of a leash for a cow, but this contraption is called a chute, and that can let us really safely um, restrain that animal. It's almost like it's being hugged inside of that device, and it keeps them safe, and it keeps us safe while we're working on them. Yeah, there's a really notable difference there between being a human doctor and being an animal doctor, which is that most of the time when you need to get a human patient to comply with something you're asking them to do, you can say, hey, sit quietly for a second, you're gonna feel a little pinch while I give you a shot, it's gonna be okay and people can understand. Now, same thing for you, Dr. Shropshire, what are some challenges that you face, something that's different about teaching, or not teaching, treating, excuse me, animals as opposed to humans? There's something that they really can't do that humans can. I think, um, like kind of like we talked a little bit in the last section is, um, you know, I think, getting them to take medications, getting them to do things at home. Um, so asking families to do various things, you know, um, a lot of cats do not like things being shoved into their face um, to take, and they are not as easily tricked as dogs. And so they may not be tricked into taking a treat. However, we talked about in last section that you can actually train your cat to learn how to take medications and it's not stressful for you or for the cat. Um, it takes a little bit extra work, but cats are actually very, very smart um, and you can do what's called clicker training 
um, to help them learn how to do that. And same for dogs. I think another big challenge that we talked a little bit about is that it's a little bit different with human medicine versus veterinary medicine with insurance and, and money is that we do run into quite a bit um, financial um, problems because a lot of what we do can be expensive and it can be difficult for people to do everything. Um, and so we do have to navigate through that, um, particularly now with COVID where there's been a lot of changes in, in the world and, and how things, um, how everybody's jobs are. So it's been quite different and something that we do have to um, work with quite a bit to try to do what's best for the patient and for the family. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So as you can all see, there's some interesting challenges that come along with being a veterinarian. For one, animals can't communicate with us in the same way that humans can. So you can't just look at a cow and say, please take this pill. I promise it you know, maybe doesn't taste good, but it's going to help you. Or you can't look at an animal and say, I promise I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just here to help. Um, and there's all kinds of other challenges that go along with that too, keeping them safe, keeping you safe. And some of the logistical stuff too, like insurance, there's a whole world of difference between being a vet and being a human doctor. And luckily these two are up to the challenge. At this point, I'd love to move into taking some questions from first our on-camera classrooms and then taking some from the chat. I do have the chat closed down right now. As a reminder, everyone, that chat is only for questions. I'm seeing lots of people send or sending messages that clog up that chat with things that might keep me from seeing other people's questions. So as a reminder, when I open it back up, questions are all I want to see in there and we'll open that back up in just a few minutes. For now, we are going to start by taking two questions first from Miss Starr's group at East Ridge Elementary School here in Aurora, Colorado, or close to the museum. And then we are going to talk to our friends up in the mountains, um, up in Edwards, Colorado at Eagle County Charter Academy. So we're going to take two questions from each of those classrooms and then we'll pull some from the chat. Eastridge, it looks like you are all ready to ask that question. Use a nice, loud, and clear voice. If you remember to, tell us your name, um, and you might need to unmute that microphone um, when you come up and when you're ready. Hi I'm, Serena. Hi, I'm Serena, and my question is, how do you deal with surgeries and loss of pets? Oh, that's a good question. Um, how do you deal with hard things? You know, when you lose a pet, um, or maybe you have to go through a surgery that's, or do a surgery that could be really difficult, how do you deal with things like that? Because it can be kind of emotional for you as doctors. Uh, Dr. Shropshire, do you want to start with that one? Sure. So um, how, do we, how do we deal with hard procedures? Is that the Just question? hard things. You know, what happens maybe, yeah, when a procedure is really hard, but also I think that question was about some of the emotional difficulty too. You know, when an animal dies or doesn't get better, um, how do you deal with some of that? Yeah. Um, so definitely that's part of our job. It's, it's the hardest part of our job, of course, is losing our patients. Um, I think over time you realize that no matter what you do, sometimes it just doesn't go your way. And that's something that's important to learn as you are a doctor, whether it's human or veterinary, that um, sometimes uh, it's, it, you did everything you could, you had the smartest people working on the case and the animal still dies. And that is something that's really hard about the career, but something that does happen. And when that happens, what I tend to do is I try to take every little piece that I can to try to learn from it and get better so that if I ever see anything like that again, um, that I do things better. And in and both Dr. Simpson and I's job, we also train um, veterinarians and veterinary students. And so I share my mistakes and my missteps with them so they also learn. So it's kind of an exponential learning process to share those experiences. Yeah, it's you you can spend a lot of time, I think, beating yourself up when things go wrong, or you can learn from it and move forward. And it seems like that's really kind of all you can do. Dr. Simpson, anything you want to add, or should we take our next question? I, I think Dr. Shropshire just nailed, nailed that it. question. Congratulations, Dr. Shropshire. That was a perfect answer. All right, let's go back to our friends at Eastridge for one more. We have a two-parter. Two parts. Bring it on. Hi, I'm Sophia, and my question is, there are a lot of questions. Hi, I'm Colin. Hi, I'm Colin, and my question is, how do you deal with stress? 
How do you deal with the stress? I don't think I got the first part of that question. Can you say that one more time for us, nice and loud? Is there a lot of pressure? Or, and is there a lot of stress? A lot of, what was the last, is there a lot of what? I heard pressure. stress. Is what there a lot of pressure? And how pressure. do you deal with the stress? Thanks for sticking with us. I think we all know how hard it can be to talk through those masks, but thanks for <laughs> keeping them on and staying safe. All right, um, a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. Um, Dr. Simpson, let's have you take this one since Dr. Shropshire did the last one. Sure. Um, so yes to both of those questions. There is a lot of pressure in this profession and there is a lot of stress that goes along with trying to take care of of animals, but also the people that um, are part of those animals' lives. And so um, I think as far as the pressure goes, um, one thing that I'll try to do is just kind of check in with myself and how I'm feeling periodically throughout the day. Um, and then if it seems like I'm feeling a lot of pressure and that's that's starting to make me feel nervous or um, upset. I'll just try to take a few minutes and kind of, you know, talk myself through that problem, kind of um, thinking about, you know, how we're going to get around those issues and also um, the fact that I'm, I'm doing the best I, I can and sometimes I can't control outside circumstances, um, but that's, that's true in all parts of life. Um, and then as far as the stress goes, I think it's, it's also important, um, you know, we, we're really dedicated to our job and we spend a lot of time reading about things and learning more, um, even when you're finished with school to try to do the best that you can to help your patients. Um, but also remembering that sometimes you'll need to take a little bit of time each day for yourself to do something that um, you know is is easy and fun and um, and kind of lets you kind of de-stress yourself. And so for me, that's you know I like to run, I like to work out. Um, I don't do it every day, but I really like to scuba dive. And so having things that I can you know try to do um, that I know will make me a better doctor because it lets me relax at, at different periods throughout the day. Yeah, I think, you know, I know we started our conversation today with two sort of really big questions is how do you deal with stress? How do you deal with things going wrong? How do you deal with, you know, taking care of animals and people and yourself all at the same time? But that's really important to acknowledge that that's a crucial part. That's a big part of what being a vet is like. So Thanks for those questions to our friends at Eastridge and thank you to both of you for answering with such honesty. We really appreciate it. Next, we're gonna go and talk to our friends up in Eagle County, so up in Edwards. Um, just as has happened before, I know you all have done this with us before, when you see your video up on everybody's screen, come right on up to the microphone, use a nice, loud and clear voice and you may need to unmute. And then we'll pull some from the chat. A little bit, there you go. Um, so when you're filling up the blood, do they get blood from other animals or do they do it from like the same animal? Oh, that's a good question. I think, are you asking question. about blood transfusions and um, when you give another animal new blood? Yeah. Sounds about right. Um, Dr. Yes. Trapster, that seems like one for you maybe. Yeah, it's, it's actually different in uh, large animal versus small animal. So maybe Dr. Simpson can jump in a little bit too, because I, I do think large animal is really cool what they can do there. But for dogs, dogs have to get dog blood. So they get it from another dog. And cats can yeah. sometimes get dog blood, but that's only in a very unique situation but it's been reported and successful. But for the most part, it's cats yes. get cat and dogs get dog. But interestingly about cats, they only have a few blood types. So they can only get certain blood. And if they get the wrong blood, they can have a major reaction which can result in killing them. So we have to be very careful about what type of blood we give. That is super interesting. Um, somehow I made it this long in my life and after talking to you all for 
however long we've been talking to each other in preparation for today. I never learned that. That's amazing. I learned something new. Um, and you gave us a little teaser. So it sounds like Dr. Simpson now needs to tell us about blood transfusions in larger animals. How does that work? So that is kind of a really cool um, thing about the species that we work on. So each of our species um, has a different number of blood groups or types of blood. Um, but for our species, those numbers are pretty big. So they have like eight different types or 12 different types. Um, but what that really means for us is that an, um, a bad reaction to giving blood from one species to another, or excuse me, from, from within the same species um, is actually rare. So a lot of times we don't have blood that's banked like with small animals. So um, we don't always need to type it. And we can a lot of times just draw blood, um, for instance, from one alpaca and give it to another one. Um, and we don't really worry so much, especially with the first transfusion, um, that there's going to be a reaction, which is kind of cool. Um, and similar to what Dr. Shropshire said, sometimes in an emergency situation, you could actually give blood from one species even um, to another. So like from a sheep to a goat or something like that, um, which is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so what I'm taking away from this is there are a lot of different ways to solve problems where that, you know, a, a blood transfusion might help with, but you have to be really careful about it. And that's part of being a good veterinarian is knowing this is an option for me and this is not. If I give this to this animal, they're not going to react well. Um, great question. Fab, fascinating answer. I learned something new right there. Let's take one more from our friends at Eagle County. All right, there you go. Why and, did you choose to? Oh, wait, hold on. There we go. Why did you choose to be a vet? Great question. We love this question. So. Uh, let's have Dr. Simpson start off. What made you want to be a veterinarian? So I first realized that I wanted to be a vet um, when I was five and I got my first pet, which was a dog. Um, she was a golden retriever. And the first time that I went to the vet with her and just saw him, you know, examine her and make sure she was healthy um, and, and how much he just seemed to really enjoy, you know, petting her almost as much as I did, it seems like, um, that really, that really made me think, wow, I could probably sit in, sit in a room and do this with dogs all day long. Um, and then later, I ended up moving to our family's ranch in Texas, and um, at that point, I got to work around a lot of uh, cows and horses, and there were a few goats in there, and it really made me appreciate even more kind of all the species, and then I thought, well, maybe I could work on all the species. Um, and then even later, I realized how much I loved just far farm animals more than anything, uh, and so then I became a farm animal veterinarian instead. That's perfect. Ooh, I'm gonna go ahead and mute you real fast. Sounds like my audio is coming through on your side. Um, that's amazing. It's really cool how a lifelong love of animals or a childhood love of animals can turn into a career. Um, and Dr. Shropshire, let's hear from you next. Yeah, I, um, uh, I guess I'm a late bloomer. I didn't know I wanted to be a vet for uh, until I was 22. Um, why did I become a veterinarian? I think when I, my honest answer is because I really love working with people and I really love animals. And I was going to go to medical school and obviously you work with people um, as a human doctor, but to me, there's nothing like the bond that you form with an owner when you're taking care of their family member, which happens to be their dog or cat. It's a really interesting relationship and bond that you form with them. And um, I just love it. I love getting to work with the dogs and cats and the different species, but I really love getting to work with people who also love animals and who take such amazing care of them and are so dedicated. So they're some of the best people I've ever met. 
That's a really sweet answer. It's good to know that the vets that I've worked with in the past when I've brought my dog in when he's sick, uh, get a lot out of, of solving those problems and making sure that our family, both you know, fur family and human family can continue to live together. That's, that's beautiful. Let's grab some questions from the chat. I see a couple right off the bat. Uh, the first, and that rhymed, look at that. And so did that. Um, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's grab a question from the chat. The first one that I'm gonna bring up is from Lisa Caven's group of at AK Teach in Kodiak, Alaska. Um, they are wondering, and let's have you both, maybe you can just give us like the three names of the animals really fast. They are wondering what is the biggest, smallest, and weirdest animal each of you have worked on. So let's start with Dr. Shropshire. Um, you can tell us real quick, biggest, smallest, weirdest. The biggest animal I ever got to work with was a a huge hoof stock name with the taku and it was about not as big as the bull but um huge um very very large animal it would be probably the size of a bison or a buffalo and then the smallest animal i've ever worked with was about um maybe 0.2 pounds about that big um, a little newt, um, and then the strangest animal I've ever worked with is probably a road runner. That's a kind of bird, if you don't know. Um, it's the state bird of New Mexico and is kind of, kind of looks like a velociraptor. So that is your Google search for the day. If you don't know what a road runner looks like, that is what you need to look up today. Um, same question for you, Dr. Simpson, biggest, smallest, weirdest. So the biggest was, and actually he was over 3,000 pounds. He was a brown Swiss steer named Frank. Um, smallest was probably something just short of a one pound um, miniature pig piglet that we helped the mom give birth to. Um, and weirdest was probably an okapi, which looks a lot like a mix between a zebra, an antelope, and a giraffe. It's a, it's a strange looking animal. So again, if you need a Google search today, okapi is another one. So roadrunner and okapi, that's everybody's homework for today, is look up what those animals are and know that our vets that we're talking to today have gotten to work with those fantastic beasts. All right, moving right along, I see a couple more questions that I'd like for you to pull, um, or I'd like to pull for you, excuse me. Um, a question from Brooke's group wondering, uh, if an animal poops during a procedure, what do you do? Um, how do you deal with the gross stuff, like slobber from a big dog or you know, big old cow poops? How do you deal with the gross stuff? Uh, let's see, Dr. Simpson, do you wanna start with that one? Sure. I bet you there's a lot of cow poop. Um, we do deal with a lot of cow poop. So one thing that we do is we wear a lot of gloves. Um, sometimes they're just gloves for our hand. Sometimes they're gloves that cover our whole entire arm um, because if we need to do a rectal exam on a cow, the other option is you just have poop all the way up your entire arm. So instead we use these gloves um, to help with that and Let's see, we do get some poop during a procedure now and then. Usually we will put one of those gloves on and just wipe it out of the way, keep right on going. Um, we do get a lot of slobber all over us if we do an oral exam on a cow. They're very, very good at making saliva. They make like 250 liters of it every day. Um, and so, I don't know, I think I've never really been that bothered by animal body fluids or um, other types of fluids. Now people is a different story. I do really get kind of grossed out by people, fluids, et cetera. Um, but I think I try to focus on what I'm doing and not really think about the, the gross stuff. There's always going to be some gross stuff in veterinary med. And uh, before we move on, I do, I don't want to, um, you know, skip the next thing that we need to talk about because the next thing we need to do is very exciting. Um, but Dr. Shropshire, for your answer, we have a special request from a group that was on 
earlier today that relates to this question. Uh, could you please tell us again about the pug in the water? Um, tell us about that. That's sort of a how do you deal with gross things answer. Yeah, um, so last session we had talked about um, physical therapy actually, and we had had a little pug who got really nervous to get into the underwater treadmill. And when he got nervous, he tended to fart. And he farted the entire time he was in the treadmill and the bubbles and the noise would startle him. And so like you see in the treadmill, he would hear it and he'd turn around really shocked and kept looking back and, you know, we would laugh and that'd make him more nervous. So we had to keep a straight face and try to just keep going and, and not make him more nervous because the more we laughed, the more he farted and the more we laughed. So um, yeah, that was hilarious and it, and it did not smell good. So there you go. Sometimes you're going to have to deal with cow poop as a veterinarian. Sometimes you're going to have to deal with the pug who's scared of his own farts. No two days are ever the same. Well, with that, um, we do have more questions in the chat that I can see and we might open it up again for some more depending on how much time we have. Um, but we also want to give some attention to some other specialties that you can have in veterinary medicine. So being a large animal vet, working with small anim animals, those are not the only options that you have. Um, and based on some of the responses that we've gotten in the chat, I have a feeling that this group might like to hear a little bit more about being an exotic animal vet. Those are the ones that work with animals like um, gosh, everything from dolphins to tropical birds to the big giraffes to, and these two both have dealt with some of those animals before. So um, Dr. Simpson, let's have you talk a little bit about what, um, why would you need an exotic animal vet? What's that specialty like? So there are a lot of other animals um, that Dr. Shropshire and I sometimes see for very specialized things. So things like um, Dr. Shropshire might look at like a ferret or a lizard um, or a newt um, or you know, a rabbit um, or somebody's pet rat or tortoise um, or even a python maybe. <laughs> um, you know, for us, there's also things like um, antelopes and giraffes um, and zebras. Um, at one time I looked at an ostrich. I don't remember why we did that, but uh, there's all kinds of, of different animals. And when you're in vet school, you do spend four years learning about all of the species. Um, and you focus a little more on some of the more common ones like cats, dogs, um, horses, and cows. But there's so many species out there that you still can't learn absolutely everything. So what you might actually do after you get done with vet school, um, you might end up going on and learning a lot more about specialized things within specialized um, species. And so exotic vets would be extra trained in something like um, zoo animal medicine or wildlife medicine um, or, you know, pocket pets. Um, and so, and that's, that's true actually of lots of different um, parts of veterinary medicine where you can go on to specialize, be very specialized in one area. It's important to know because yeah, there's so many different species out there, you know, and it's not just dogs and cats as we've talked about and not just cows and horses and llamas and goats, you know, the animals that we see all the time, they're not the only ones who need vet care. So we need specialists who are ready to take on whatever, whether that's a giraffe or a garanook or a toucan or even a newt. Um, with that, let's take a few more questions because we are coming up on the end of our time. It's amazing how fast these always go. Um, I would like to take one more from each of our on-camera schools. So if you are from Eastridge Elementary or Eagle County, let's get one student up in front of the microphone ready to go. I'm going to open the chat up as well uh, one last time if you have a question that you want to submit. And remember, we are looking for only questions in the chat. Um, all right, it looks like we have somebody ready from Eastridge, so we're going to go over to you for one more question. Going to you. Oh. Hi, I'm Rodina. Hi, I'm Rodina. How many pets do you see per day? I got that question. I don't know if you heard it. It was, how many pets do you see per day? And maybe you can just give us a quick number, Dr. Shropshire. Depends on the day, but on average, 12 to 28 to 30. That's a busy day. Super busy. 
Awesome. Let's grab one now from Eagle County going over to you. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and unmute. Right, there you go. What's it doing? Did you get an animal that can't be cured? Oh. oh, that's a good question. Have you ever had a case where there, the animal could not be cured? I can see both of you sort of nodding. Um, Dr. Simpson, do you want to tell us about one case really fast or just give us a brief overview? Sure. Um, so unfortunately, yes, there are times when we get patients that have um, a, a really significant medical or surgical problem and it can't be fixed. So one of those types of cases that we deal with, um, there's actually a type of cancer that cattle can get um, that's caused by a virus. People don't get it, it's just for cattle. Um, but when we find it, we know that it's not treatable. Um, and that is that is really, really hard, um, both on the animal and the and all the people involved, us, the, the owner. Um, and so the, the good things that we try to take out of that are um, keeping that animal as, as comfortable and kind of normal as, as possible um, for as, as long as we can by just treating the symptoms and then um, ed, you know, using that as an opportunity to educate people about what they can do to help all the rest of the animals that they have in their herd because we deal with a lot of situations where it's not just that they have one or two animals, they might have, you know, 25 or they might have, you know, a couple thousand. Um, and so trying to take, take the good, the good parts out of it that we can and, and help, help the patient and the owner as much as we can through that situation. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's a hard answer, I know. Because um, yeah, it's sometimes things don't work out the way that you want them to work out. But again, that's just part of being a vet. All right, we got a whole bunch of them in the chat, so let's pull a couple of those, and then it's gonna be time for us to say goodbye. This was 45 minutes has already That's gone by. We were just talking about so much cool stuff. Um, I see one question specifically asking about things like tissues, um, but why sometimes, um, for some context, Dr. Shropshire, you have mentioned that sometimes your work involves taking things out of an animal when they maybe ate something that they weren't supposed to. Um, why would an animal do that? Why do animals like dogs sometimes eat things that aren't food? Um, <laughs> I think sometimes they eat things because they're bored um, and there's nothing better to do. So I think a lot of times owners, um, I think they're at home alone and, you know, that blanket looks like might be yummy. And so they'll chew on that. Um, other times it's because it might smell like food or look like food. So we, we have pulled out so many strange things out of dogs. It's bizarre. Um, but one of my favorite that I remember um, hearing about was a very large python ate three light bulbs that looked like eggs. And so I think they probably thought they were eggs. And so they ate three light bulbs, which was a cool x-ray. Yeah, I bet that was a cool x-ray, but maybe not super cool for the python when it was not getting nutrients from any eggs because they weren't eggs, they were light bulbs. No. Yeah. Um, one last one that I'm seeing, uh, and I think this is a great one to end on to sort of bring us both home, um, is, is it a great job to be a vet? Do you like the work that you do? There's a picture of the python. Um, you can see him, he's got something in his mouth. Um, maybe one of those scopes for an endoscopy. Um, the last question that I think we'll take a look at today um, is, do you like being a vet? You know, what do you love about your work? We've talked a little bit about um, this is a challenging job to have for a lot of different reasons, but what do you really love about it? Let's have Dr. Simpson start off. So I love so much that every day I'm doing something different, um, something that's not a it's never exactly the same as, as the day before or even the same type of procedure from before, but it always ends up being something that I, I hope um, helped an animal and helped their people. Um, and in addition to being able 
to have that aspect of it, uh, Dr. Shropshire and I also both have jobs that involve some teaching of vet students too. Um, and so we get to do this job, uh, which is which is awesome. It's always exciting and it's always fun. And we get to share it with students too. Yeah, you get to pass on your wisdom and make things better for other people. That's a pretty amazing thing to get to do. How about you, Dr. Shropshire? Any last words to bring us home for today? I think Dr. Simpson captured it very well. And only thing I would add is one thing that I love about the job is that at the end of the day, if you're feeling sad or upset, there's always a dog or a cat or a cow or something in the hospital that you can go pet and hug and they'll always give you a head butt or a purr or lick your face. So there's always something fuzzy to pet to make you feel better. And that's ultimately what it's all about, right? We're here, we're doing this because we love our animals and our animals love us back. All right, everybody. Well, with that, I think it is time for us to wrap up for the day. Thank you so much to Dr. Simpson and Dr. Shropshire. I'm going to open up the chat if you want to say a big thank you and a big goodbye to them. Thank you for sharing your expertise today. Thank you for answering fun questions, hard questions, easy questions, uh, questions that are a little bit strange and questions about poop. Uh, we had the whole gamut today. And thank you to all of you for sending in those questions today. It was great to get to hear from you. And we hope that you'll be part of the next generation of veterinary scientists and, and veterinary practitioners. So thanks for being here today, everybody. If you're one of our on-camera schools, uh, you can unmute and say goodbye and make sure that you check out the next, next attraction. Oh, wait, hold on. Thank you. Two check out next you check out um, some coming attractions to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science or make sure you join us for dogs. Um, come learn all about those fuzzy friends that live in your living room. They sleep on your couch. They hang out on your bed um, and make sure too that you join us next time for Scientists in Action, Ancient Mummies, New Discoveries. Thanks for being here today, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Stay healthy, stay curious, keep asking questions, and go hug your dog for us. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.